Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 5, which covers the eukaryotes of microbiology. In our last chapter, we looked at just a single category of microscopic organism, which is the viruses. But in this chapter, we are going to look at three categories, and those categories are the three that are composed of eukaryotic cells. They are the fungi, the protists, and the helmets. So we're going to tackle these one by one, starting with the fungi, then moving on to the protists, and then finally finishing off with the helmets. So we'll get started by looking at fungi. Fungi are a diverse group of organisms, but they do share some unifying characteristics, including the fact that they are chemoheterotrophs. You may remember that this means that they obtain their energy from chemicals and they obtain their carbon from organic sources. Usually fungi in, are involved in the decomposition of plant matter. Uh, in this sense, they play an important role in ecosystems. Fungi come in many different forms, and only some of those forms are microscopic. I'm sure we're all familiar with mushrooms as a type of fungi, but that's not the type of fungus that we are concerned with here. In this lecture, we are focusing on unicellular fungi, also known as yeasts, multicellular fungi, also known as molds, or fungi that can transition between these two stages, which are called dimorphic fungi. Another unifying characteristic of fungi is the fact that their cell walls are composed of a material called chitin. Chitin is actually the same material that composes the exoskeletons of insects. So, um, for example, when you squish a cockroach and you hear that crunching sound, that is the chitin that is crunching, and that's the same compound that makes up the cell walls of fungi. They reproduce either sexually or asexually, and we'll talk about those different mechanisms. And an important part of their reproduction is the use of structures called spores. So we're going to take these three uh, types of fungi step by step by looking at the molds first, and then the yeasts, and then looking at dimorphic fungi. For each of the types of fungi, we are going to first look at the physical characteristics, and then we'll talk about their reproduction. So the physical characteristics of molds are that they are composed of multicellular filaments that are called hyphae. The singular form of this word is hypha, but when we're talking about multiple filaments, it's hyphae. Hyphae come in multiple forms. They can be septate, which means that they are divided into cellular units, such as the hypha that you see right here in this depiction. Or they can be cenocytic, which means that the filament has multiple nuclei that indicate that multiple cells have merged together and they do not have uh, separations between them. So septate has separations, cenocytic does not. When hyphae are growing, they grow from the tip, but every part of the hypha, hypha can grow if it becomes separated and breaks off from the existing filament. And we'll talk about that when we talk about mold reproduction momentarily. When we're looking at the hyphae of a mold, there are typically two different types of hyphae that are dedicated to two different roles for that mold. The vegetative hyphae are dedicated to obtaining nutrients. And we can kind of think about these as being like the root system of the hypha. This is not exactly like a root system of a plant, but um, this would be the component that, if we're growing them on a plate, is embedded in the agar and is sucking the nutrients out of the plate. The aerial hyphae are named for the fact that they will be projecting upwards into the air, and they are dedicated to the production of spores for reproduction. So here we can see another closer up depiction of the aerial hyphae and their associated spores and the vegetative hyphae feeding them from below. Now when we get a bunch of hyphae together, it forms something called a mycelium. A mycelium is a filamentous mass that is visible to the naked eye, which is formed from the accumulation of numerous hyphae. So we've all seen a mycelium before if we've ever experienced bread mold, which is what you can see right here. Each of the individual filaments is microscopic, as are the spores, but when you get a huge quantity of them together, suddenly 
it's not microscopic anymore and you can see it with the naked eye. So this is called mycelium. You probably also know that molds grow pretty quickly. You can go to bed one night and wake up the next morning and suddenly your loaf of bread is covered in mold that wasn't there the day before. And so scientists have caught on to this and realized that molds may represent an important renewable resource and uh, that by growing mycelium and then compressing it into a type of particle board, this can be a source of furniture making material, which is faster growing and in that sense more renewable than wood. There's another company out there that is doing something similar with mycelium in order to make faux leather products and producing items like wallets and purses that look like they're made out of leather, but they're actually made out of tightly compressed fungus. So in this checkpoint, what you're looking at here is an image that was drawn by Robert Hooke, who developed some of the most powerful early microscopes. And this image is one that he drew of mold looking through the microscope. So in this drawing, where would you find the vegetative hyphae? Would you find it in the area designated letter A or the area designated letter B? And in this image right here, we can see um, several hyphae under the microscope. Unlike the hyphae shown on the right, the hypha on the left here is not divided into cellular units. And so it would be described as what? Now that we've talked about the structure of molds, we're going to move on to talking about their reproductive processes. There are two types of reproductive processes that molds can exhibit. One of them is called fragmentation. Fragmentation is exactly what it sounds like. It's where a fragment of a hypha breaks off and turns into its own fungal colony. Because remember, we said that although these hypha grow from the tip, if any single part breaks off, it can then develop into its own filament. This is kind of like if the pad of a prickly pear cactus breaks off, for example, and then it develops roots and starts growing a whole new cactus. The same thing happens in fragmentation with molds. However, this is an asexual mode of reproduction. And that's because there are not two partners involved that are bringing their um, genetic material to the table. Instead, this single piece, the single cellular unit is breaking off and then essentially um, developing a clone of the original mold. There's also sporulation. So sporulation is the second type of reproduction that molds can exhibit. Spores, as we mentioned, are formed at the aerial hyphae of a mold. And sporulation can be asexual or sexual. We'll talk about both asexual or sexual sporulation in just a moment, but here's a close-up picture of spores formed in aerial hyphae of molds. Here we have an image under a light microscope, and here we have an image under an electron microscope. So we'll start by taking a look at the sexual sporulation of molds. In other words, the version of reproduction that involves two different molds coming together and mixing their genetic information. The interesting thing about fungi and molds is that genetically, what we might consider to be the adult version of the fungus, it actually has a half set of genetic information much like we might find in the sperm or egg of humans. That's what is meant by 1N right here. It means it has a half set of chromosomes instead of a full double set. So each cell in a mycelium has a half set of genetic information. But what can happen is when two molds get together, they can perform plasmogamy, which is where these uh, haploid or half genetic information cells will fuse from two different mycelia. And that's designated here by showing you two different colors of nuclei. We've got the little red nucleus here from one mold, and we have a little black nucleus here from the other one, fused into a single cell. Once the cells have fused, then the nuclei fuse. This is called karyogamy. 
And when karyogamy is complete, what you have is a zygote. This is the only stage at which the mold is diploid or possessing a double set of chromosomes. Again, strange because virtually every cell in our bodies, aside from the reproductive cells, are diploid. But for molds, this is the only very brief stage in which they are diploid because immediately after the zygote stage, they undergo meiosis, wherein their genetic material is divided in half to generate spores. Now these spores can then go on to germinate into new full-blown uh, hyphae and filaments and, and develop into mycelium. So in this way, molds are able to uh, reproduce sexually and remix material from multiple different organisms. But this is not the only way that sporulation can work because there's also asexual sporulation. Asexual sporulation is much simpler than sexual sporulation because it simply involves the mycelium generating spores directly and then those spores germinating into new mycelia. Now, this mode of asexual reproduction, of course, does not introduce any genetic diversity because these spores will be a genetic clone of the cell that they were derived from in the hypha. And when they germinate, the mycelium that they give rise to will be a genetic clone of the spore. So asexual sporulation is simpler and faster, but it doesn't produce genetic diversity the way that sexual sporulation does. So now that completes our discussion of molds, and we're moving on to yeasts, another type of fungi that is not multicellular like the molds, but single-celled. They are also not filamented. They are uh, single-celled, as you can see in this image right here, but they may attach to each other through the production of these short truncated filaments called pseudohyphae that you can see depicted right here. They typically reproduce through a process called budding, which we've mentioned before, but we're going to take a closer look at it here. The steps involved in budding are first, a bud initiates on the surface of a parent yeast cell, which you can see occurring in this animation right here. The bud will grow, and meanwhile, the parent cell's nucleus will divide. Two copies of the nucleus will be created, and then one of those identical copies migrates into the developing bud. Once the nucleus has landed in the bud, cell wall material will be synthesized in order to divide the bud from the parent cell. And then eventually, the bud breaks away from the parent. Now, this animation stops before we can actually see the process of the bud breaking away. However, when the bud does break away, it leaves behind something called a bud scar, which you probably have noticed on previous images of yeast cells that you've seen. These are signs of where the yeast cell has previously budded. Lastly, we'll say a few words here about dimorphic fungi, which are the third class of fungi that can grow either as a yeast or a mold, depending upon environmental conditions. For example, depending upon what the temperature is, what the CO2 concentration is, or other factors, there are certain species of fungi that can grow as filaments, or they can grow as single cells. Right here, we see Mucor indicus, which is a dimorphic fungus that is transitioning between a yeast-like form and a mold-like form. In Mucor indicus, it is carbon dioxide concentration that determines its form. High carbon dioxide accumulation results in mold-like growth, and lower carbon dioxide levels results in yeast-like growth. Many pathogenic fungi that are capable of infecting humans are dimorphic fungi. Being dimorphic actually gives a mold, uh, or rather a fungus, a advantage because it has two different forms that it can grow in and adapt to and survive in many different environments as a result. So this completes our discussion of fungi one of the categories of eukaryotic microbes. 
And now we're going to move on to another category, the category of protists. So we learned in chapter one that protists are unicellular eukaryotes. However, this is just about all that they have in common with each other. Protists is more of a historical classification left over from a time when we knew much less about the relatedness of living organisms. Today, with DNA technology and the ability to actually analyze organisms' genetics, it is now clear that protists really have no business being considered a category at all because they are so diverse and they share so little in common with each other. Everything that you see here on the slide is a protist, and as you can see, they're all quite different in their characteristics. And now we can confirm that they are all quite different in their DNA as well. However, um, at the time when the protist category was developed, they seemed to share a lot in common compared to other forms of life. They were single-celled and they were uh, eukaryotic, and that was pretty much good enough to stick them all into the same kingdom, of which there were five at the time. There was the kingdom of protists, the kingdom of monarins, which at the time uh, included both bacteria and archaea, which we now know are actually two separate groups. There's also the kingdom of fungi, the kingdom of plants, and the kingdom of animals. So this system of five kingdoms for classifying organisms was developed at a time when pretty much the only basis for um, coming up with these groupings was the appearance of an organism. However, today our classification system is a lot different because DNA analysis has revealed that rather than clustering organisms into five kingdoms, if we look at their level of genetic relatedness, then eukaryotes should really be clustered into six supergroups, as they call them. So note that this system only considers the eukaryotes, not the prokaryotes, which we look at separately. We can see three of the old kingdoms represented here. We've got land plants, fungi, and animals. And everything else that you see that I haven't highlighted here is a type of protist. So this gives you an idea of how diverse the protists are and how widely their traits vary. But we are going to narrow our focus and look only at some of these protist groups, especially the ones that have clinical significance. We are going to look at the groups Excavata, Chromovalata, and Amoebozoa. And we're looking at these groups because while most protists or uh, protozoans, as we'll be specifically looking at, are free living, some are parasitic and use humans as the host for their parasitism. And these three groups are the ones that include parasites. So on that note, before we go any further, we need to take a moment to discuss symbiotic relationships. Symbiosis is defined as living together in close association. Parasitism is just one type of symbiosis. There are a variety of different types of relationships between separate organisms that fall under this category. One of them is mutualism. And mutualism is a symbiotic relationship wherein both individuals benefit. So for example, E. coli cells grow in the human gut where they synthesize vitamin K that our bodies then use. The E. coli get a place to live, and in return, they generate vitamin K for us. This is a mutualistic relationship in which both species benefit. There's also commensalism. Commensalism is where one individual benefits and the other is not affected. So for example, demodex mites, which are a microscopic type of insect, live in human hair follicles in a large percentage of people. However, you would never know it because they have no impact on us in almost all cases. So the demodex mites benefit by getting a place to live, and we as their hosts are unaffected. Parasitism, however, is the type of symbiotic relationship wherein one individual, namely the parasite, benefits while the other one, namely the host, is harmed. For example, Giardia intestinalis is a protozoan parasite that lives in the human intestines and causes diarrheal disease. 
Giardia in this arrangement is clearly benefiting, while humans end up being harmed. Now, not all parasites have a straightforward life cycle. Many parasites actually have very complex life cycles where they have more than one host. In these cases, we can designate the definitive host versus the intermediate host or hosts. The definitive host is the host within which the parasite infects in its sexually mature form that is capable of sexual reproduction. Intermediate host is any host that the parasite infects during its developmental form. There can be multiple intermediate hosts, but typically there is only one definitive host. So protozoan life cycles are often incredibly complex. They may move through multiple different hosts, they may move through multiple different wet reservoirs, and as they do so, they may develop into a few different distinct forms, um, which we can designate with different names. But the two main forms that we want to look at um, in, in our lecture here are the trophozoides and the cysts. The trophozoide is the stage within which the protozoan is feeding and growing. However, during times of stress, protozoans in some cases are able to form a protective cyst in a process that is called encystment. This is not a possibility for all species, but some, especially parasitic and pathogenic ones, are able to do this. Right here, we can see Enthamoeba histolytica forming a cyst structure, a protective shell that allows it to withstand stressful environmental conditions including high temperature, low moisture, low nutrients, etc. Many parasitic protozoans are transmitted between hosts during their cystic stage. A cyst is often required to keep them alive when they are outside of the body and in between different hosts. So now let's move on to taking a look at those three supergroups of protists that we were going to narrow our focus to because they include some parasitic members. And those are Excavata, Chromalveolata, and Amoebozoa. We'll take a look at these one by one. As we look at them, we're also gonna highlight if there are any particularly noteworthy free living members of this group. So for Excavata, one of the important free living members is the Euglena. The way that Euglena move is through the use of flagella, which you can see under the microscope here as this tiny little thread that's projecting from one end of the cell. Many of them are photosynthetic and contain chloroplasts, which they use to generate their energy. They also possess an eye spot for sensing light, which you can see right here as this little red pigmented dot at one end of the cell. So euglena are a great example of that phenomenon that we talked about earlier called phototaxis, whereby a cell is able to move through its environment toward a source of light. There are also parasitic members of the Excavata supergroup. Two noteworthy ones are the genus Giardia and the genus Trypanosoma. Giardia is an intestinal parasite that uses a sucker disc to attach, attach itself to the inner wall of your intestines. It is the most common intestinal parasite in the US and it causes a very nasty diarrheal disease that sometimes can be really difficult to get rid of. Um, I had a cat once that was infected with Giardia and it was a long road for him to be able to clear that uh, parasite from his intestines. Trypanosoma, belongs to the same Excavata supergroup, but structurally they are quite different. These guys have this uh, fluid undulating membrane that they use to flow throughout their environment. In this image right here, the red blood cells are uh, the red circular objects, and then the trypanosomes are these light blue, artificially colored um, undulating structures here. They are transmitted through insect bites, and there are two noteworthy human pathogenic species within this uh, genus. T. brucei is the cause of African sleeping sickness, and T. cruzi is the cause of Chagas disease. And between these two, the one that is endemic to the Americas is Chagas disease. 
Chagas disease is actually found in Arizona. The CDC put out a warning in 2019 about the presence of the organism that transmits Chagas disease, the kissing bug, which looks like this. So these bugs are carriers of the trypanosoma parasite, and the reason why they are named the kissing bug is because they are attracted to the carbon dioxide in a person's breath, which draws them to the mouth area where they tend to bite. And when they bite, they transmit the parasite to you. Luckily, um, it's easy to avoid getting infected with this disease as long as you are protected when you are sleeping and not sleeping outside um, on the bare ground, for example. That is uh, something that would put you at risk for bites from the kissing bug. So at this point, I have another checkpoint for you about these parasites. Trypanosoma brucei reproduces in humans and undergoes development in the gut of the tetse fly. So which is the intermediate host, humans or the tetse fly? Now we're on to our next supergroup. We're on supergroup two of three that we will consider, which is Chromalveolata. Chromalveolata has both free-living and parasitic members. One noteworthy free-living member are the ciliates. Ciliates are organisms that move and feed through the use of numerous cilia that project off the surface of the cell. You can see them in this, uh, this video right here under the microscope, all of the many tiny cilia which are used for movement and feeding. They're used to sweep particulates into the cell for feeding. Most of them possess a unique feature in that they have a double nucleus. They have a macronucleus that is dedicated to conducting the organism's metabolism, and they have a micronucleus that is used for reproduction. They reproduce through a process that is called conjugation, and it's called conjugation even though it's a separate process from conjugation in prokaryotic bacterial cells, it is the mixing of genetic information through direct cell contact, which is what you can see going on right here. Some of the more noteworthy parasitic members of Chrome alveolata are Plasmodium. This genus is the genus that causes the disease malaria. Um, which is a, a disease that affects hundreds of millions of people around the world. So plasmodium is a very significant human parasite. Specifically, it is a parasite of the blood. And in this image right here under the microscope, we can see human red blood cells. And circled here for you are some examples of blood cells that are infected with what's called the ring stage of this parasite. You can see that uh, artificial staining has been used to color that ring stage this dark purple color. And you can see the quantity of red blood cells that are infected with the ring stage plasmodium parasite, in some cases with two parasites in a single cell, like this cell right here. Plasmodium is transmitted by mosquitoes. And we'll talk more about its transmission when we talk about diseases of the cardiovascular and lymphatic system later. Toxoplasma is another genus within this supergroup that is parasitic, and it is the cause of a disease called toxoplasmosis, which results in serious birth defects when a woman acquires a primary infection with this parasite when pregnant. Surveys indicate that a lot of people in the U.S. have antibodies against toxoplasma. And so there are a lot of people who, ha who ha probably have a latent infection with this parasite. However, the time when it becomes a problem is when a woman is pregnant. Um, if she acquires the infection while she is pregnant, not if she has a pre-existing infection going into pregnancy, or for immunocompromised people, especially people who have AIDS. It is transmitted from cat feces or from unwashed produce because it can also be found in the soil. Last but not least, we have the supergroup Amoebozoa. Amoebozoa includes organisms that move through the use of pseudopods. And a pseudopod, what that literally translates to, it means false feet. A pseudopod is a projection of the cell cytoplasm, 
where it basically just takes part of its cellular corpus and throws it in a particular direction, and then the rest of the mass of the cell follows along with it. And these pseudopods can be used for feeding. They can be extended out and used to engulf particulates, which are then brought into the cell and digested. Some amoebas are parasitic. Entamoeba histolytica, the one that you can see right here, infects the small intestine of humans and causes a diarrheal disease called amoebic dysentery. It is particularly severe um, because Entamoeba histolytica is, uh, one of its mechanisms is it engulfs and destroys red blood cells. And you can see in this microscopy image right here, some of the red blood cells have been pointed out. Nigleria fowleri is another parasitic amoeba. This is the one that is infamously known as the brain-eating amoeba. It lives in warm freshwater sources, and the typical way that it is thought to infect a person is when it is exposed to the mucous membranes of the sinuses or the throat, and from there it makes its way to the brain and causes a severe form of encephalitis called amoebic encephalitis. Now, by no means are all members of the group amoebozoa parasites. Um, many of them are what we call cellular slime molds. And cellular slime molds are a very fascinating group of organisms um, because these are organisms that have a transitional stage where they move between being single-celled and multicellular. They are amoebas that aggregate together when conditions are unfavorable in order to salvage some cells in the population while sacrificing others. So I'm going to play this short video for you here so you can get an idea of how these cellular slime molds perform this process. So we are going to cap off our discussion of protists with a checkpoint. A free-living protozoan is isolated from a pond and observed to be moving through the use of cilia. What supergroup does it likely belong to? So this leaves us with just one group of eukaryotic microorganism left, and that is the helmets. You may remember that helminths are actually multicellular animals. However, because their eggs and larvae are microscopic, we do consider them as a part of microbiology class, even though their adult forms may not be microscopic. Parasitic helminths have typically very complex life cycles, similar to protozoans where they may have multiple hosts or multiple natural reservoirs that they live in. And helminths can come in a few different reproductive forms, um, which also makes them unique as animals. They can be dioecious, which describes a helminth that has the male and female reproductive parts in different organisms. So for example, um, humans are typically dioecious, where the male and female reproductive parts reside in separate organisms. 
But there are some species that are monoecious, which means that the male and female reproductive parts are found in the same organism. So biologically, they are hermaphroditic. Um, and before we move on from this slide, I do want to say that these are not artificial depictions. They are both real images of helminths. Um, this is a image of a hookworm. And down here, this is an image of a tapeworm, which was one of the finalists in the 2017 Nikon Small World Image Contest for microscopy images. Um, so these are both very real, very nightmarish organisms. So um, helmets as a broad category can be divided up into a few different subcategories. And the two that have clinical significance are the flatworms and the roundworms. The flatworms can further be divided in two different subcategories, which are the flukes and the tapeworms. So we're going to start by looking at the flatworms, specifically the flukes, then we'll move to the tapeworms. And then lastly, we will finish off by looking at the roundworms. So flukes have some characteristics that unify them as a group. They have flat leaf-shaped bodies, like the one that you see here in this microscopy image. And they feature ventral oral suckers that hold the worm in place. They lack a complete digestive system, and instead uh, they absorb nutrition through their uh, outer layer of cells from the environment. They typically exhibit highly complex life cycles that have multiple different hosts and many different reservoirs. Tapeworms, on the other hand, which are the other type of flatworm, exhibit suckers and sometimes hooks attached to what is called their scolex. The scolex is what we refer to as the head end of the worm, and the hooks and suckers both serve to hold it in place within its host organism. They can vary in length from one millimeter to 10 meters total. So there are such a thing as very small tapeworms that are only a one millimeter in size. Although if you've ever seen a video of a tapeworm, it's probably one that tends to be longer in length. Like flukes, they lack a complete digestive system and instead are forced to absorb nutrients from their surroundings. So the head, um, the hooks and the sucker, they actually don't play a major role in the nutrition acquisition for the worm. The nutrition is absorbed through its skin. The body segments of the worm are called proglottids. So unlike roundworms, which we will see are unsegmented, tapeworms have distinct body segments that are generated from the scolex as a starting point. And these proglottids can be broken off and the worm will still live as long as that scolex is in place. So when extracting a tapeworm, it is of course very important to make sure that the scolex is removed because if not if the scolex is left in place and only a, a portion of the proglottids are taken away, the worm still lives. So in this checkpoint, we're gonna take another look at C. sinensis, which is the fluke that we previously saw. Tell me, based on looking at its anatomy here and the labels on the image, is this a dioecious or a monoecious type of fluke? Lastly, we have the roundworms. So roundworms, unlike flatworms, have rounded bodies that are not segmented, and they range in length from a, as little as one millimeter all the way up to one meter. Roundworms are absolutely ubiquitous on the surface of the planet. They are the most abundant animal group on Earth. Another word for roundworms is nematodes, and um, the roundworms, or in other words, the nematodes, are so numerous that if you were to count up every animal on the planet, including helminths, four out of every five animals numerically would be a roundworm. They are so ubiquitous and found in all environments, so much so that um, there's this book by this, um, this nematodologist called N.A. Cobb. He wrote nematodes and their relationships. And in his book, he describes this completely nightmarish passage, um, which I've clipped for you here, 
where if you took away all matter on Earth except for the nematodes, you would still be able to see where the outlines of trees and mountains were because there would be a coating of nematodes outlining them. That's how many nematodes there are in our world. Roundworms can be distinguished from flatworms in that they possess a complete digestive system, whereas flatworms do not. And unsurprisingly, given how ubiquitous they are, they are the most common cause of chronic infectious diseases in humans. To give you some idea of uh, how many chronic infectious roundworms there are in the world, it is estimated that the roundworm Ascaris lumbricoides infects over 1 billion people on the planet. Pinworm, which is the most common helminthic infection in the U.S., is estimated to infect 13.9% of people in the U.S., including 30% of children. Whipworm infects over 1 billion people, threadworm between 30 and 100 million, and hookworm infects over 500 million people. Hookworm is one that can be found in the U.S. as well, and I personally know someone who was infected with hookworm. So now we've completed our discussion of the helminths. We just have one final checkpoint to finish this off here. A parasitic worm with an incomplete digestive system and oral suckers is isolated from canine feces. Is this worm likely a roundworm or a flatworm? And once you finish this checkpoint, you are finished with chapter five.